All right, we have finally moved on from chapter 13 to chapter 14, which is about matching. So what we were doing all through chapter 13 was talking about regression, right? And, and that's a statistical estimation method that's very popular in causal inference. And why is it popular in causal inference? Uh, well, one main reason is that it is very easy to use regression to control and, or adjust for confounding variables and therefore close back doors, which makes it, of course, very popular in causal inference where closing back doors is what we are all about. However, what was what's the real purpose? Why why, why does regression work? Like, what, what are we doing when we close a back door? Well, what we're doing in that case is we're removing all variation uh, through the variable that is on the back door and therefore controlling for it, right? If we think that we want to know the effect of wearing uh, shorts on eating ice cream, we know that having a hot day is going to cause both of those things to occur. We don't want to be fooled by the fact that hot days will cause those things to occur so that when we look in the data, we see a positive correlation, but it's not really causal. How do we fix it? Well, we can adjust for temperature. And what that means is that we think about all the variation in ice cream eating that's driven by temperature changes and all the variation in shorts wearing that's driven by temperature changes, and we get rid of both of them. And in the case of regression, that means subtracting out whatever we can predict with temperature and using just the residual. However, there are other ways to remove all variation associated with a variable. What if we just pick a sample in which there is no variation? So in the case of the temperature thing, that would be like taking a sample only of hot days uh, and seeing whether there is uh, variation, uh, whether uh, ice cream eating is related to shorts wearing within hot days or within cold days, right? So you can just pick a sample in which there is no variation and then therefore that variable can't possibly be a confounder anymore because it's not driving any relationship because it's not driving anything because there's no variation in it, at least in your sample. That's what matching is all about. Matching is the process of uh, closing a back door, controlling for something, con removing, removing a confounder by picking a sample in which there is no variation uh, in the variable that, in which you're looking at, or more generally, picking a sample in which the one group, whatever groups you're comparing across, typically a treated group against a control group, uh, they have no differences in terms of that variable. Right? You can make sure that there, there's no that that variable is not driving any differences because you've gotten rid of all the differences. So we have a day over here, maybe in a treated group that's 70 degrees, another one that's 50 degrees. We have another one that's 70 degrees, another one that's 50 degrees, uh, and we compare them, uh, and we know that temperature can't be driving any differences between these groups because these two groups have the exact same temperatures in them. Right, so it can't be driving any difference. They're already comparable on that basis. So let's use a slightly more realistic example. Let's say we're interested in the effect of a job training program. We have people who go into a job training program. We want to know whether that affects whether they get a job or not. Uh, now, let's say that it just happens to be the case that in this job training program, you had about 80% men in the program and only about 20% women. Uh, and you want to know whether this program is effective. So you see how what proportion of them ended up getting a job after the program. And you want to compare them to a group that did not get the job training program. But in this group, in the control group, you have a more even gender mix. Like maybe it's you know 500 men to 500 women over here, but you got you know 80 men and 20 women over here. So it's a big old gender uh, bias over here, but not so much over here. Now you can't just make the comparison straight across uh, because if you found that there were a difference in the job getting rates, well, maybe that's just because there's more men over here and men are more or less likely to get a job than women are, as opposed to over here where it's more even, right? So if we saw that maybe this group was more likely to get a job, we wouldn't be able to tell whether it's the effect of the job training program or the effect of gender. We have a back door that we need to close. So what we might do is we might pick just part of this group over here. We're going to select a comparison group that is comparable to our treatment group on the basis of our backdoor variable and thus doing close our backdoor variable. So maybe we will pick 80 men and 20 women from this sample over here. Now, the gender mix is the same in both groups, and so when I compare them, whatever differences are there, it can't possibly be because of the different gender mix, because now there's not a different gender mix anymore. The gender mix is the same. That's the idea of matching. Now, why might we do this rather than just running a regression and controlling for gender, which we could certainly do? Uh, well, you know, it's better on, than regression on some things. It's worse than regression on other things. It's better in the sense that you don't need to rely so much on things like linearity assumptions, right? Ordinarily squares is all about assuming that your predictors and control variables come in linearly. Matching is not so concerned about that, at least many forms of matching. There's more flexibility in terms of estimating different kinds of treatment averages uh, with your matching estimator. Now, we talked about that back in chapter 10. However, on the other side, it also requires a lot more decision making and your, your results can be a lot more sensitive to the particular decisions you make on how to put your matching process together. So matching and regression, one's not better than the other. They just do different things. And in fact, you can combine them in certain ways uh, that are discussed in the chapter. So if we're going to do matching, how are we going to do it? Well, there's two main sort of ways in which we can approach the problem of matching. Uh, one is literally selecting a matched sample. 
in which you pick a subset of your control observations uh, that are like the treated observations. Another approach is weighting, where you pick a weighted average of your control observations such that it, the weighted average looks like your treatment observation. So let's talk about these two different approaches. So the first one that I mentioned, picking a matched sample, is a lot like the example that I already gave, right? Let's say we have 80 men and 20 women over here. We have an even gender mix over here. Uh, maybe I will pick an 80 to 20 ratio of men and women over here so that the gender mix is the same in both of the groups. Uh, this ensures that there's no gender differences on average between the groups, and therefore I have control for gender. I've picked a matched sample. Uh, now this works, of course, even if we don't just have binary predictors. Maybe we have some sort of, maybe there's an income difference as well. Maybe on average, you know, the income distribution in the treated group looks different from the income distribution in the untreated group. Well, if I have one person who earns, who used to earn $100,000 a year before they started needing a job and they're male, I can pick somebody who used to, who earns $100,000 and is male over here. Maybe I have a, uh, someone who is also male and earns $20,000. Well, I can pick somebody who is male and earns $20,000 over here as well, or at least close to $20,000. Right? Maybe I can't get it exactly on the nose, but I can get sort of in the range. In each case, I am picking a sample that is very similar on all of its characteristics to this sample, uh, such uh, at least all the characteristics that I'm able to measure and match on. Uh, and in doing so, I end up with two different groups that are basically the same on all of those uh, control variables and therefore are comparable. And I think that if I've, if I've picked enough matching variables that I've closed all the back doors, picking a matching variable and matching on it is the, gonna close a back door in the same way that controlling for it in a regression would, then I think I've, if I've closed all the back doors, these two groups are comparable, I can uh, assign any difference in their outcomes to being the effect of treatment. That's the picking a matched sample approach. The other approach is weighting. I can construct a weighted average. Now a weighted average is just like taking a regular average, except that not everybody counts the same. Let's say I'm taking an average of incomes between two different people. This person over here earns $100,000. This person over here earns $200,000. Now, what's the average of their incomes? Well, 100 plus 200 divided by two, that's $150,000 on average. But a weighted average would not count each of them equally. Now, let's say I want to do a weighted average. Let's say that for whatever reason, I'll talk about how to pick the weights in a bit. This person, I think, gets double the weight of this person. I think they count twice as much. Uh, and so if I'm going to average them out, I'm going to take that hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to weight it twice. I'm going to sort of count this person two times and I'm only going to count this person once. So when I do that, I do a hundred thousand plus a hundred thousand. So that's uh, plus this one, that's 400,000. And then the, the weights that I've given to everybody in total is three. This person gets two, this person gets one. And so, uh, it's like, I sort of have three people that I'm taking the average over cause I'm counting this person twice. Uh, so that gives me $133,000, uh, on average. Uh, and it's a weighted average, right? This person counted more, right? The person with a lower income counted more. And so the average is a bit closer to them than it is to this person who earned $200,000, right? When there was equal weighting, it was 150. When I weight this person more, it's 133. It's closer to them because I think they counted more in the average. That's what a weighted average is. So how can I apply this to matching? So let's go back to that job training example. I got 80 men and 20 women over here. I got 500 men and 500 women over here. Uh, well, I need to simply get, assign weights to this group such that the gender mix on in the weighted average is the same as the gender mix over here. So each man, there's 500 men, and I want them to match the 80 men over here. So I give each of them a 80 divided by 500 weight or 0.16. All the women over here, I want those 500 women to accord to the 20 women over here. So I give each woman a 20 divided by 500 weight over here or 0.04. So each man counts much more uh, because I want to match this sample where there are more men. So I want this sample to look like that sample. So I'm gonna count each man more to reflect the fact that there are more men over here. Each woman's gonna count less because there are fewer women over here and I want this group to look like that group. Uh, and so by calculating the weighted average, the average income that I, or the average probability of getting a job over here with the weights is going to account for the differences in gender. Because uh, it can't be the fact that, you know, that's just that there's more men over here because there are, there are fewer men over here, but I'm counting each of them more so that it looks like there's as many men over here as there are over here. So those are the two main ways in which we can approach the question of matching, either picking a matched sample or applying weights to people so that the averages look like the averages over here. Now, why might you do one or the other? Why might you do picking a matched sample versus weighting? Well, we'll see a lot of the details as they come up as we go through the process of matching and how you make those decisions. But a big one is the bias variance trade-off. Uh, a lot of the decisions that you make when you're deciding how to do a matching analysis uh, come down to, do you want to pick something that brings you fewer observations to compare to and therefore more noise because you have a smaller sample? Or do you want to pick better observations that are better matches for what you want and therefore are better comparisons and therefore less biased in their comparison that do a better job of closing down the back door. Uh, so in this case, 
picking a weight using weights allows you to use everybody, right? I don't have to pick just a certain number of people who are good comparisons. I can use everybody and just give them weights so that they the average shakes out properly. So that uses everybody, but in some cases that might mean that I'm using worse comparisons and therefore increase the bias on my estimate, even though by using everybody, I reduce the variance and therefore give me, myself more precise estimates. Whereas picking a matched sample usually will throw out more observations because I'm only picking some of the observations over here. Uh, so I'm picking better observations so there's less bias, but also I'm picking fewer observations so there's more noise and less precision. That sort of trade-off is going to pop up a lot as we go through different kinds of matching procedure questions, as we will do in the next set of videos. All right, see you there. Thank you.